All right, uh, so I've been watching a number of TED Talks online, and I wanted to start off this in the most unconventional way possible. Uh, I want to start off with a question. Uh, and the question is very simple. How many people here, and don't give me a half hand up, give me a full hand up, how many people here know who this man is? Steve Jobs. All right, look at you guys go. Smart cookies here. All right, all right. And how many people here, and please don't lie because I might call on you and expose you, how many people here know who this man is? Bill Drayton. Okay, good. I was banking on most of you guys not knowing who he was. So uh, who is Bill Drayton? Bill Drayton is widely regarded as the greatest social entrepreneur of all time. He created an organization called Ashoka, Innovators for the Public, which essentially connects social entrepreneurs from each part of the world to one another so that they can collectively gain better access to resources and guidance. Oh, also, by the way, he also coined the phrase social entrepreneurship, so no big deal there. But uh, why did I tell you all this? It wasn't to sound intelligent, though I, I hope I did. Uh, but <laughs> it was mainly because I believe that when it comes to entrepreneurship, our first thought always goes to people like Bill Gates, to Steve Jobs, who are incredible, and rightfully so. But we tend to forget the social entrepreneurs. We tend to forget social entrepreneurship as a realm of entrepreneurship. So what is social entrepreneurship? Very quickly, social entrepreneurship is taking traditional business practices and applying them to modern day social issues. Social entrepreneurs balance three key things daily, people, planet, and profit. And to show how big of a scale social entrepreneurship has become, between 2010 to 2015, over 4.8 million social ventures were created in the United States by people under the age of 20 alone. So, with that in mind, my thesis is very straightforward. I believe that the golden age for social entrepreneurship has dawned on us. That is to say, I believe that it has never been easier than now to engage with social entrepreneurship. Look, conventional business has, and currently does, have barriers to entry. For example, the need for higher education, the need to be in or near an urban setting. But I believe that social entrepreneurship is one of the very few fields professionally where it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, the real thing that's important is what your idea is and how you plan to execute on that. And my story is proof of this. I am an immigrant to Canada. I have and have had a speech impediment since grade seven that was much worse before. And before I even graduated high school, I've started a social media agency and I've also started the world's first ever youth fund. But in no other time do I believe that this story is as likely to happen in now. And in no way do I consider myself an anomaly, an exception to the rule. I believe I am the rule. But generally, I also find myself pretty lucky because entrepreneurship, that's me, cute, cute me. Uh, entrepreneurship was, in my opinion, programmed in my DNA. Uh, when I was six, I started my first business, which was a fake bank. I called it Money Bank, and I got all my relatives to sign on to it and open fake bank accounts. And I charged them commission. I provided them social benefits like free pizza slices on a movie night. And all this time, for about a year, uh, I thought that I was getting richer. Until one fine day, my mom, who's probably watching this live stream right now, came up and told me, you know, Manu, swish you are not making any money, and just because you write business plans and just because you put your salary down for each does not actually mean that you can take that to the bank or take that to a store and buy anything. And that kind of angered me because I was highly dependent on my parents for gaming systems and toys at a younger age. Like, don't, don't get me wrong, they bought me that stuff, but it was highly conditional on numerous factors, including my behavior. And in no way was I ever gonna get strong-armed by my parents, definitely not at the age of seven. So. What did I do? I was in Singapore, that's where I immigrated from. And uh, I remember that about a week later from that conversation, I went to my neighbor's house and uh, I went up to their lawn and I took some flowers from their lawn, slapped a bow on it, went back to my own house, rang the doorbell and tried selling those flowers right back to my own mother. <laughs> you gotta try, right? <laughs> And then a year later, when I was eight, I immigrated to Canada, and I actually never realized when I was younger that there were, there were, there were social barriers and social issues facing immigrants. I thought that I was in the same country, it just looked a bit different, and there were different people around me. But I decided to start a hovercraft business. I employed my own dad as my chief project engineer, and after doing that, I essentially took a Havoc Heli. How many people here know who a Havoc Heli is? 
Oh dear, I have to explain this. All right, uh, Havakel <laughs> is essentially a styrofoam remote controlled and rechargeable helicopter. So the remote control, essentially you plug in the helicopter to the controller after you're done using it for about eight to nine minutes. So I dismantled that helicopter and took the styrofoam base off, took the rotor and the motor and, took, and built a new styrofoam base. I put the rotor right through and attached the motor and then I took an HMV plastic bag that I recently got and I wrapped it around and after a bit of testing, I had built my first and only rechargeable and remote controlled hovercraft. And I sold it, my only and my first, for $200. So you could say I was quite the kid, maybe, but I don't think I was exceptional in that regard. I think many kids have strong entrepreneurial spirits and even more kids while they're growing up start to feel empathetic for other individuals who are suffering, people that they might have never even seen, but simply seen a picture of, or simply read in their textbook. I believe, though, that a decade ago, the missing link was between empathy and entrepreneurship. And I think that's the link that social entrepreneurship is able to solve. So look, I had no unique personal characteristic, despite my strong belief and continued belief that I am by far the most attractive man in the world. But, but, what I did have were ideas, and what I did have was a plan to execute on that idea. So, my first idea, which was not going to lead to any hefty community service or trademark violation, was World Thinks, or at that time it was called Canada Thinks, it was a pilot program. So uh, my buddy and I were kind of angry. We, we've gone to a lot of conferences, we were in grade 10, we were studious, we were trying to get into university and impress people, and um, all of the conferences we went to, all we did was sit there and listen to people talk. This is a bit ironic right now, by the way. And so we were, we, <laughs> we were pretty angry about that. We were like, we want to change things. So uh, we decided to found a new type of interactive conference. So with that, we went to over 40 corporations in Calgary. And yes, there are actually over 40 corporations in Calgary. Um, <laughs> And when we went there, we asked for funding. And so most of us, by the way, all of them rejected us, just peer preview there, but uh, most of them were kind to us and they told us either our idea was just you know, a bit bad and it needed work uh, or it needed a bit more fine tuning or we had to expand the idea or we needed more sponsors. But some of the people who really irritated me were the people who told us that we were inexperienced or we were too young. Again, proving my earlier point that there remains barriers to entry towards conventional business. And that is a big thing for young people like myself. But hey, it was the first idea I had, which was 100% legal. So I wasn't going to let go of that idea that quickly. So I decided with my partner to start Canada's National Youth Fund. And the way I did that is by essentially trying to get different people and different people who were under 20 to start their own initiatives in their own city and then collectively generate revenue towards one central fund. We've now operated in Bermuda, Argentina, the United States, and Canada, and I'm very proud to say that the National Youth Fund has become the World Youth Fund that's collectively trying to address the problems that youth entrepreneurs are facing and the problems that they're trying to solve. So, with that in mind, in many cases, I think this shows the democratization of social entrepreneurship. That is to say, I believe that social entrepreneurship has the relevant questions being two things. Firstly, what is your idea? And secondly, how do you plan to execute on those ideas? As opposed to conventional business that takes a look at who are you? Where do you come from? Like Nazar told you previously in his speech. So in many cases, I believe that we are in a monumental point in history because of social entrepreneurship. Because the fact is now, even if you aren't privileged, you can actively take a part in trying to solve global problems on a macro stage. Just look at me. In grade seven, I realized that I had a pretty bad speech impediment. I couldn't say R's properly, I couldn't say S's properly, and at times I couldn't even say my own name, which was a bit of an issue, because my name is pretty long in its real form, so whenever I was sitting down in the classroom, I just knew when the teacher was about to call my name. It'd be like Edward Smith, Quinn Underwood, and I'd be like, yes, here, present. Uh, <laughs> and then they'll be like, who are you? And I was like, oh dear. But the fact is that I feel very lucky that I've never faced any sort of bullying in my life. But I'm not naive and I'm not ignorant that there are people with verbal, with physical, with mental disabilities that are ostracized, that are stigmatized, and that are explicitly or implicitly barred from certain opportunities. So there are two key takeaways for this. The first is that social entrepreneurship is a tool for all of us. What I said earlier is true. 
that people, regardless of who you are, if you have an impediment, if you don't, you can start and engage with social entrepreneurship by building your own venture, which is huge. But second of all, in many regards, I believe that social entrepreneurship can allow people who are labeled as disadvantaged by society to find their own social presence. The most empowering fact for starting my own social venture wasn't the actual starting of it, or the actual even product of it, or what led to, or what the impacts were that came out of it. The biggest and most empowering feeling for me is the fact that I was actively breaking the narrative that society pushes down the throats of disadvantaged individuals. What is that? It's that disadvantaged people are in need of help. That is one half of the coin, I believe. I believe that disadvantaged individuals who are labeled that way can offer a lot more than simply being the people who receive our help. Look at me. I was the person who was labeled as disadvantaged, yet I was the one providing help to other people. Yet I was the one that was able to generate revenue and help other people, despite the fact that society told me that I was the one in need of help. So I believe that's very, very powerful. Now look. At this point, you might be like, all right, Swish, you're being a bit naive. You're being a bit optimistic. You might be like this guy. But let me tell you now that even if there are some things that stop you from making a social venture, we all, we all live busy lives. We all can't start a business tomorrow. But we all buy things. And that's where I really want to talk about how even if you don't start a social venture, you can engage with social entrepreneurship now. How? Well, as I said earlier, we all buy things. And today, in our world, consumers actively drive social entrepreneurship. When you are able to buy the product or the good or service from a social venture, you are actively helping spur a tremendous engine of poverty alleviation. I'll give you an example. Recently, I went to Calcutta, India. And over there, I bought this bracelet. I went up to the store vendor. And I asked her uh, how much, of course in Hindi, not, not in English. Um, and she told me that it was 60 rupees, which is equivalent to about $1. But then she told me, for every bracelet you buy, out of those 60 rupees, 15 rupees will go to the orphanage down the road. So I bought four bracelets. She took a book out. She made me sign my name, as well as put my email address in. And a month later, I received an email from the orphanage's supervisor thanking me for my donation. In my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, that street vendor in Calcutta is running the best accessory store not only in India, but in the world. Why? Because I could have gone to the place beside her that was selling bracelets and rings and other types of things like earrings, but I might not have been able to help individuals that were in need, that actively needed my help. So in many cases, I would challenge each of you today, think about it. The next time you're in a grocery aisle, be informed of the choices in front of you. When you're buying a toy for your child, or if you are a child and you're buying a toy, <laughs> think about your choices. Maybe, just maybe, the toy to the right of the one you really wanted, despite being a bit more expensive or of lessened quality, could actively help someone that you had never seen, that you had never even heard of, but that benefit would actively go towards them. So, I believe that social entrepreneurship needs to be continued to be supported by individuals and institutions, both public and private, to become a norm within society. Because it is a force for good, but it's something that could help us pass down lessons to our children, from being empathetic to people who are labeled disadvantaged, towards actively helping people that you might have never seen in another part of the world. And I feel that when future generations look back, they will see now as a monumental point in history and perhaps label it the golden age of social entrepreneurship. So to conclude, in the end, I want to end off with a quote from a man we all know now, Bill Drayton. And he said something very important, which was, social entrepreneurs are not content just to give a fish or teach how to fish. They will not rest until they have revolutionized the fishing industry. I believe that revolution is here and it's here to stay. Thank you.